back again to badquaker.com podcast with me today is a very special guest mike shanklin he has almost a million views on uh, on his videos on youtube and if you haven't if you're not familiar with mike if you haven't seen his youtube videos get to badquaker.com hit the link get over to youtube and you're going to be amazed mike thanks for coming on the show with me hey it's, it's great to be here what an honor uh, i've seen a lot of your work and uh, i'm just glad i can contribute well, thank you. I had no idea you even knew who I was or what I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did a little research on you. Um, I saw some of your interviews. Um, I saw one night you had an interview at 3 a.m. in the morning. I love your YouTube videos, too. Um, I think you really hit on some pertinent points, something that uh, volunteers should use more often. They often get stuck in, uh, you know, repeating a couple uh, pretty, pretty generic phrases, and I wish they would expand some of their vocabulary, some of their ideal structure. There's so many points that we have. I mean, we have all these facts on our side. Um, I, I just hope that as volunteers out there listen to, to your videos and my videos, that they can they can look at it from a bigger picture and be able to attack this uh, with, with different types of uh, uh, points that just basically debunk statism altogether. Yeah, that's an excellent point. It's kind of like having more uh, more arrows in your quiver, so to speak, to have a, a wider <laughs> variety. Uh, because really, you know, the people that we're trying to reach out there are coming from a vast uh, wasteland of different kinds of ideologies that, uh, you know, to try to try to pigeonhole everybody into one set of, uh, of things is really not going to be as productive for us. You're right, and, and even think about this, let's take, the, let's take it the next step. Let's say we are living in it and we achieve this voluntary society. Even inside of that, there, there's going to be people who, um, you can, you're still going to have racists in the world. I mean, some people are just going to be ignorant. Right. Uh, they're not allowed to use you know, aggressive coercion on other people. Um, but you're going to have some that are anarcho-communists, and they're going to build a, their own little commune, and you're going to have anarcho-capitalist cities. And I mean, even inside of volunteerism itself, it, there's still going to be sects and chunks and niches. As much as we would all like for all of us to, to be pretty similar and all get along perfectly, uh, you know, well, nobody's ever saying the world's going to be perfect. We're just saying there's a better way for society to handle complex problems. All, it, it seems, in, in a sense, it seems really simple. If you just remove this one, this one flaw from society, which is the aggression of the state, if you just take that one thing out and don't try to make a new anything, just take that one thing out and then see what happens. Right, and that's the thing. So many people like to, to say the word we. You'll see one of my videos on YouTube. It's, it's titled, um, You Are Not the Government. And what I try and get, you know, so many, so many young people, especially that I talk to, when they talk about countries, it's always us and them. You know, there's always this division that statism creates um, between the international, you know, regions, uh, between these different countries, these different states, these different nations. And uh, the mind kind of gets lost in this division. Voluntarism, that would never be an issue. That would never be a problem. You, you are not a part of this government. I might be a, a white person. But that doesn't mean I'm like every other white person out there, just like just somebody else might be Indian or Mexican or, or black. It doesn't matter. Everybody is an individual. And until I think we, we see society kind of take a step towards individualism, uh, you know, with that perspective, in combination with the non-aggression principle, with the zero uh, aggression principle and axiom, until we reach, you know, somewhere close to that, I don't think it's going to take 100% of the people to, to get to that point. But it's going to take a pretty big chunk. And it doesn't take, it's not like it's going to be just 80% overnight, but it will take getting to 5% of the people. And then it's just going to slowly spread to 10%, especially as governments continue and they continue to produce the same failures. People aren't just, I mean, it, it, you can't have that much insanity, at least I hope not. Who knows what the future is going to hold? But in, in all reality, I just can't see the state 
continuing on forever and ever and ever, um, it, it will fail, and it's built to fail. It's the it's the way it's designed is is faulty from its very roots, and I, I think that's the message that we as volunteers have to deliver to the public. In a very real sense, our greatest weapon in fighting the state is the existence of the state. It's uh, it's so horrible in every way and so hideous in every way that the more people get to really see what its nature really is, the less likely, the less, the less number of people are going to be fooled by it. Um, on the other hand, if the, as long as the state can small, can stay small and weak and doesn't intrude upon anything, then people don't really realize its nature and they really never get to see what the thing is like, you know, in its fullness. And, and, and here's another thing, too. You're right about that. I mean, the state... <laughs> trying to educate people about voluntarism is it's going to be a lot easier to spread voluntarism in a voluntary society where you have more examples of how it works um, when you can look back on the past and see all the failures of sadism mm -hmm. living in it it's very difficult I uh, think about the, the proportion and, and I'm talking at great margins uh, of, of people of children that are indoctrinated into public education most of them um, struggle in many you know different fields as far as science, as far as math, mm. as far as uh, reading, um, I, I was I was lucky enough to go to, to a mixture of both. Now I had more private school than I did public, but I, I got a, you, know, uh, you know I had a nice experience uh, in both fields, in both the, the public sector and the private sector as far as education goes. And there is a huge difference. Mm -hmm. um, anybody who says there's not, you know, maybe they're living in different regions. And I'm not trying to compare, uh, you know, Blue Valley to some, you know orphanage, you know, type Christian uh, private education. Right. I'm talking about the average education systems. Those who are outside of the state's control often have a greater incentive to truly educate, to, you know, try and get MENSA awards, to try and have the top ACT, ACT and SAT scores. Um, this is just the, the way that the market tries to push it, where the, the, the public school just tries to make everybody as equal as possible. It's, it's well known for holding back those who need to advance quicker um, to try and pull up those who are actually pulling the rest of them down. And I think this is a sign that the state um, brings to, to this market, to this industry, to education, um, is it stunts education on, on true rationality and reason. It's, it's not as if uh, you can ever have a true anarcho-capitalist go into a public education system and, and, and just talk about the facts like we're talking here on, 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 you know, on this radio show. It's not that easy. It's just like you're not going to get an anarcho-capitalist uh, or a voluntarist up at the very top of government like president or senator. Uh, a true voluntarist, a true non-aggressionist mm -hmm. will never get to that point, and um, nobody will ever take them seriously if they even try to, to, to preach up there. Um, so this is what we have to, to deal with, is the fact that we are ever surrounded by the state, and we're trying to educate people out of it while still being trapped to it. And so many people are just indoctrinated to, to, into it from birth um, that they never even see it. It's kind of like they get blindsided by it. Um, I, I know for a fact that that's the case because uh, that happened to me for 25 years. You know, <laughs> it's, it's just a few years ago, five years ago or so, that I really truly started to understand voluntarism and the non principle. Heck, there was a point I still strongly correlated it with Ron Paul. I, I, you know, I mean, I didn't really truly see um, voluntarism until about two years after um, starting to support Ron Paul. So it took a while for me to even break out of, of that minarchist shell, which I, I've long since broken part of, and I'm still embarrassed about, um, you know, the first 25, 26 years of my life, um, <laughs> the, the status that I was. But the point is, I'm a perfect example others who might be listening out there, that change is possible, that you can gain more sanity, <laughs> that you can enjoy life more, and, uh, and honestly and truly examine virtue ethics, something that I, I don't think humanity has done enough, which has created this ruckus, this circus, this mythical creature called statism. You know, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, because I wasn't sure uh, what your background was as far as how long you had, uh, you know, <laughs> how long it had been since you took the red pill, so to speak. But uh, the, the amazing thing is, going back, I think back like in, in the late 80s when Ron Paul was running for president the first time, and the people that I knew who were libertarian-leaning or the few that were actually, you know, anarchists of one form or another, they had pretty much always been that way, and there were just no new recruits. There, or I don't know if that's the right terminology, but there were no new people. People in 88 and 86 and 85... 
you knew the little circle of people you knew, and that was it. And uh, we, we didn't seem to be expanding in any way. And I don't know, you know, it's a weird combination of the growth of the state and Ron Paul and the Internet and the abundance of information from places like the Mises organ, Organization and, and, you know, Mises.org and things like that. All of these seem to have come together in like this perfect storm to create this uh, this new wave of, of liberty that's coming through. Yeah, it's, it's very true. I... I... I am lucky enough. I, I don't know what it is. For some reason, I just have a passion for this. I, I see an ill, and I can't just not do anything. I just have to do something. You know, if, if you saw somebody, some poor lady getting raped, you wouldn't just walk away. I mean, some people would, but I can't. Right. And that's the way I feel so passionate about this cause. Um, it, it's, it's, it's really good, though, that I just happen, you know, to be halfway decent to getting the message out in some form or fashion. Some people don't like the way I, I advertise the message. Some people love it to death. <laughs> and they, you know, they're big supporters. But the, the fact is, I'm lucky enough to have people in my life that I have, you know, help them at least understand the non-aggression principle and the rest kind of, I just, I, I sound like I have to make them think. It's not like I tell them what to think. And here's, I just give them my opinion. I say, listen, you're going to have to come to your own conclusion. And I say this to everybody. Um, but there are some certain facts that are out there that, uh, you know, please debunk them, but if, if you can't debunk them, let's not argue about them anymore. Let's just make them facts, because we know they're facts, and we can move on from there. But after that, you come to your own conclusions. And I, I'm lucky enough to have seen the fruits of my labor, you know, come to some sort of a realization where I have lots of different friends and, um, and, and people in, in my life that have come over to voluntarism. It's not like you have to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds like you have to, like, pack up and change your whole life. So you might have to change some things in your life. But most of us already live that voluntarist lifestyle, you know. I, I, we've, all, we've all heard the argument that most of us don't go around stabbing people. We don't go steal people from, uh, we don't steal from people. Right. Uh, you know, we don't kidnap people. Um, I mean, this is just a pretty well-known fact. I don't have to carry a machine gun with me everywhere I go, um, unless maybe I'm in, like, Brooklyn, where culture, which, you know, as Stefan Molyneux says, the, the first four letters in that explain the rest of it. It's cult, you know. The culture down in some of the uh, more impoverished regions, you know, they, they generally have less work ethic, less advancement opportunities, um, and not only that, just a lower uh, education level. It, it, it's really just... You know, outside of that region, most people don't have to, uh, you know, worry about getting shot or just having people come steal from them. It's it's generally 90% of the people or the population just don't do that. We're all pretty good people. So it's not like you have to make this jump to voluntarism. So when I say they changed over to voluntarism, it's not like they changed this, this great thing in their life. It's just coming to the realization that threats of aggressive coercion on peaceful individuals, people like me who have never infringed on somebody else, you don't have a right to point a gun at me. And, and that doesn't matter if one person does it, if 300 people do it, if 300 million or the world 6.5 billion plus people do it. It does not make it ethical and it will never be ethical. We have to come to this fact. So once again, I just try and lay out as many facts for people as possible and let them come to their own conclusions, which I just lay out a path for them to see uh, you know, virtuous behavior and uh, rationality and reason. Mm. And then they can make that choice on their own. Well, that's the only option we have, really. What are you going to do, force somebody into <laughs> that? It doesn't really work that way. Uh, even the greatest brainwashers inside the state, um, the, the propagandists for the state, because don't act like voluntarists are the only ones who, who have their information out that they're trying to spread to, to spread voluntarism. The state spreads mm -hmm. propaganda every single second, every yeah. single, not just day, minute, uh, an hour, but, but every second. Uh, let's, let's not act as if they're not you know, guilty of this as well. But it is important... Uh, for us to realize that many of the, the greatest brainwashers out there, um, they didn't have to force people into that ideology. They didn't have to point a gun at them. They, they basically conned them into it. I don't have to con anybody into anything. That's the beauty of, of my, you know, doing this on the side and uh, spending all this time on things. It just actually makes me feel more ethical. Um, you know, maybe, maybe there is no real marginal gain out of me doing this. Maybe there's zero utility, right? We could argue that as well. Mm. But I don't, I don't think that's the case. I have seen gains. I have seen positive results. And I think I'm going to continue to see positive results uh, exponentially uh, as more and more people find, find that they're running out of excuses. <laughs> that's what it seems to come down to. Most minarchists or past minarchists I know, they just ended up running out of excuses. And I was similar. 
that's how you know I really came over to anarchy. I just started running out of excuses for the minarchist arguments, and uh, the whole left-right paradigm just kind of you know it just slapped me in the face one day, and I saw it for what it was, just one you know one fist on on the same beast. Um, you know, basically using tyranny on on peaceful individuals, and that's that's all the state can do. And let's let's be honest here. And if if some people say, well, you know, you have to have the government to protect property, and you have to have government out here to protect people from stabbing each other, and, and all these other different things, right? Mm-hmm. Well, if if this if it's such a great thing that's out here that's doing all this great, people should be able to voluntarily fund it as they see fit. I mean, why why do I have to fund something. Just because you think it's great doesn't mean I have to fund it. That's right there, you know, breaking the non-aggression principle. That is aggression um, through taxation. Right. Uh, let, alone, let alone taxation through citation. Um, so we have to come to that question of, you know, if, let, let's say the state uh, is responsible for property rights. What if I want to go with my own protection services? Mm-hmm. What if I want to go with my own dispute resolution organization or my, mul- my own multi-tiered arbitration system? What makes me have to go through your mediation? Who, who is, why is it moral for you to force me into your monopoly? And that's what the state is. As long as people continue to fool themselves and imagine that the state is not a violent monopoly, let alone just a monopoly before we even get to the, the part of aggression, that it is a monopoly and it's a violent monopoly on top of it, mm-hmm. um, we're never going to make gains. That's why I attack those facts so wholeheartedly. I put so much time and effort to try to strike the root. And, uh, and, and you know, that's where we're going to see the, the, the most gains. This is my two cents, of course. <laughs> uh-huh. I'm speaking for all volunteers here, but this is where I come from. Yeah, I think you're dead right on that. You had one campaign that I that I really got excited about on YouTube, where you had people just make a little clip of them saying what they were and why they were, and uh, you just had person after person saying, "I'm an anarchist," and I, I was I was thrilled by that. That was a really neat campaign. Yeah, that that video was called Anarchy Rising. I'm actually in the works of making a new one, um, and I would love your input, Ben. <laughs> always, <laughs> always wanted to have a great voice like yours. You know, somebody who's, who's been out there defending the message of, of true voluntarism for a while. But anarchy, anarchy rising actually has netted uh, tens of thousands of hits, and, and it's still out there. I, I haven't looked at it recently to see where it's at. You know, I have almost a hundred different videos out there that I put a lot of time and effort into. Um, but that is one of. Uh, you know, the videos that I still cherish deeply. Uh, one of my favorite videos, top five, definitely. Um, Anarchy Rising itself did have a, a multitude of different uh, voluntarists or non-aggressionists or anarcho-capitalists or freedomists, whatever you want to call it, uh, that were on this, this this video reel, and it just played, you know, from start to finish, people first introducing themselves and then hammering away on different points of voluntarism and then closing really, you know, firmly with the fact that government is aggression and uh, that voluntarism is basically the non-aggression principle and, uh, and just stressing the fact that anarchy is not what you see on TV. Right. I, I had a clip uh, from a very special person. Um, you know, I have lots of people that I just can't thank enough for helping me make that video. Um, but I just had to, to hammer away on the fact that most people have this negative connotation built into their head about the word anarchy, right? I mean, right off the bat, most people think of somebody throwing a Molotov cocktail into a government building or tearing down some private property or something like that. Right. That, that's, just, that's just the first thing that pops into people's heads. But that's that's... I don't think I've ever seen an anarcho-capitalist, somebody in a, volunt- a true voluntarist, ever partake in that type of behavior. I, I don't know one friend who's ever done that, um, uh, and I know lots of voluntarists. You know, <laughs> I mean, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of them. My Facebook wall is is completely flooded. Um, I, I can't even add any more people. Mm-hmm. Uh, people are on this waiting list, and I have like over a thousand people on my queue list. Uh, it's it's on Facebook or, or excuse me on MySpace. I think it's up to eighty five thousand. So there's a lot of people who have just watched my videos and they just at least hey listen I'm here for support. I'm going to give you that number. I'm going to show the rest of the world that you're not just some crazy loon out here just talking about just nothing. You're actually onto something. And um, that's that's kind of the thing we have to do is make this message more mainstream. As long as we're stuck as the outlier people, as the people that don't have a message, you know, we're never going to be taken seriously. And I'm not saying you got to enter the political realm. In fact, I, I, I encourage you not to. Um, I, I don't think that's going to bring any 
anything good, um, and that it's going to actually waste your time and your resources that you could be diverting towards other things, you know, with greater efficiency. But it is important for us to spread this message to as many different individuals as possible. Now, I'm not saying they're always going to be receptive, but we have to make it. This is why the internet, you know, like you were talking about earlier, and I'm sorry for talking and ranting so much, but there's this. There's a great point about the internet and how this connectivity between um, all peoples, really, especially as um, these third world and second world countries also gain internet access and have computers, um, and we can and webcams, and uh, they can uh, maybe even translators th that we can all communicate. Finally, you know, I, I I am not somebody who's for one world government, but I am for one world as far as individual rights. I I, I don't want nations. I, I don't want states. I, I, no offense to anybody who loves America out there. I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm glad you like this little region um, and what you think it stands for, but I, I, I just don't like any of it, and I don't, I don't need a master, nor do I want to put a master over somebody who doesn't want one. The whole idea that 51% of a population can, you know, somehow control the other percent, uh, whatever percentage that might be, is, is, is kind of ludicrous to me. It's really almost, it is insane. And it's, I, I heard Seth Amon talk the other day about how he's embarrassed, you know, to have to tell his kids, and, and describe the world to his kids. Yeah. I don't have children yet, Ben, but I'll, I'll tell you this right now. I completely agree with him already. I don't even have kids. I don't want to have to explain, you know, why wars are going on or why this guy in this costume can come over into my house or to my neighbor's house, uh, you know, and, and just and do it, you know, do whatever the, the little piece of paper that he has says. It just, it, it, even though the people never did anything to anybody else, I don't have to explain the war on drugs and how many deaths have occurred, even though marijuana has technically never even killed anybody, let alone the fact that, I, I, you know, whether I smoke it or not or you smoke it or not, that does, has nothing to do with the fact that you can actually consume this plant or any other plant and not infringe on other peaceful people. As long as you're not hurting on rights, there's no victim, there's no crime. This is what is uh, so important about things like, like FIJA, the Fully Informed Jury Association. One of my good friends, James Cox, he is over, uh, he worked with FIJA for a while, and, and they did have a great job. This was basically based around jury nullification. Mm -hmm. Jury nullification states you don't have to get 50% of the population to uh, agree to this ideal. If real change happens, you know, if you're going to have any type of change in the system, and you're going to have to go to jury duty anyway, you can at least try to use jury nullification if you are a juror in a case in which you feel uh, there is no crime. In other words, no victim. Uh, you know, sometimes we have these, these crimes that are called crimes against the state. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there is no real true victim except for uh, the government is the victim or society is the victim. Um, in cases like that, where no other person, no individual has been harmed, you can actually use jury nullification. And FIJA, this is something I, I, I'm sorry to use your radio show as kind of a shout out, but it's a very important cause to me. I have a very deep concern, and uh, there's, there's great intrinsic value for this cause. Um, now, a lot of those people who run FIJA are, are minarchists. And they, and they have to be, because they have to fight inside of the system to try and, and pass out these pamphlets on, on the sidewalks where they're actually going to make a, a bit of difference. Um, but really, all you have to do is get one person. You don't have to get 50%. You don't have to get a majority. You just have to get one person to hang the jury, and it could lead uh, down the road to either, you know, the, the charges are either being dropped or pushing it back to a jury that will not convict. So this is what we're, we're, we're looking to do is spread education, spread ideals, and um, not only that, help people you know, understand maybe how they can uh, do do this type of service. This is one thing I encourage everybody to do, um, and it's not because I work in an electronics store. <laughs> I, I, I really want people to connect with each other. Go out and get a webcam. There's, you know, I'll tell you, Ben, the thing that's helped me learn the most is years and years ago, uh, especially when I was a minarchist or even a statist, I would make videos and, and just talk, and I'd play them back and just watch myself talk. Mm. And um, there, there always seemed like to be this disconnect between you know, back when I was more of a statist and now. But I never really, until I saw myself saying that, I was like, man, that sounds crazy. You know, that, that doesn't sound <laughs> right. And then when I started doing that with volunteerism, I never had to worry about what I was saying. It's just, it just happens to be factual, and nobody can debunk it. So I've never gotten in trouble for it like I would have had I produced some of my old statist videos. And that's why I think I also have an advantage too, Ben, is a lot of other people, um, you know, like you were talking about them, there's, there's just anarchists who, some of them were raised in, in anarchist families, and, and I'm talking about peaceful anarchists, once again, I, I want to stress that one more time. Um, they're raised in very peaceful anarchy families, so they just, they're raised that way. I had kind of the blessing, if you want to call it this way, um, I had the blessing 
uh, with quotation marks around it, of being a statist first for a majority of my lifetime and then coming over to voluntarism. So I know where many statists are coming from, mm -hmm. whereas people who are kind of raised in anarchy um, might not understand why all these statists are saying and doing all the things they do. You know, I, it, it's, it's just, if we're going to be talking about my background, it's something I think it's an important point um, for people to realize. Those out there who did come to anarchy later on in life, mm. um, you you actually have an advantage over those who didn't. This is why I think Stefan Mullen is so good. He remembers very, very well where he was 5, 10, 15 years ago, and he knows which points he used to argue, and he knows how to debunk them now. Um, and that's what you have to do, is go back on your own life, see where you've made mistakes. Not only will it make you, know, uh, you feel better about uh, where you've come from, but it'll also help you advance your own, uh, you know, uh, dialectic skills for spreading the message of freedom to more individuals. Absolutely. You can't really present an honest picture of anything if you're not uh, willing to be honest with yourself and really self-examine and look back at yourself and really say, uh, do I really believe what I'm saying? Why do I believe what I'm saying? I also wanted to mention that uh, something you touched on there a little bit is the importance that each each different person has a voice on this, even if you think, if you're listening to a podcast like this or you're watching a YouTube video or whatever, and you think, well, yeah, but I could never do that, you know? But yeah, you can. It's really a lot easier than most people think. The, like the first podcast that I did was horribly clumsy and, and very difficult and awkward. But you do it a couple <laughs> times. I'm sorry. How long ago did you start doing it? I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ben. I'm just curious about you, too. Uh, some of you know, my viewers are going to come, and they're going to want to know something about you, because you're obviously <laughs> such a, a strong proponent, and, you're, and, and I think we're very similar in ideas. When were you? you know? How would you like to support BadQuaker.com and get something nice for yourself at the same time? I want to tell you about Survival Gear Bags. It's run by my friend Kelly, who believes in and adheres to the non-aggression principle. Kelly's customers know him for his great customer service and his personal touch because Kelly handles all customer service himself. The main focus of Survival Gear Bags is to allow you to build your own custom emergency kits with quality gear. Now I know this because I bought my bug out bag from Survival Gear Bags over two years ago and I've gone all over the country with it by my side. And you can rest assured that the prices will always be the best they can be at Survival Gear Bags. And if you use the link from badquaker.com, they'll probably throw in something for free for you with your order. Now how do you do this? Well, it's simple. You go to badquaker.com. On the right side of the page, click on the picture of the backpack. Then look around at Survival Gear Bags and find the stuff you want. You'll help badquaker.com, and you'll support a merchant that's one of us. Now, I want to tell you about another way you can support badquaker.com and get something really cool at the same time. Shire Silver. Shire Silver is the proud seller of silver and gold trade cards. Shire Silver believes that silver and gold trade cards will show the world a better way to save, spend, and share precious metals. So what are silver and gold trade cards? There are specific weights of gold and silver laminated inside credit card sized tradable cards. They're a handy and affordable way to trade precious metals. These cards received nationwide recognition when they were widely used as barter at the New Hampshire Porcupine Festival. You want a beer and a hot dog? Hand them a Shire Silver 5 card and get a Shire Silver 1 spot back as change. So again, what do you do? Well, you go to badquaker.com. On the right side, just below the backpack, you'll see the Shire Silver trade cards. Click on those cards and then check out Shire Silver's site. Be sure and watch Ron's video that's right there on the main page. And then swap some of those ridiculous Federal Reserve notes for something of real value. Something you can keep, trade, or give as the coolest gift ever. But be sure and use the link from badquaker.com. Thanks, folks. When did you very first start doing a podcast, and um, and how how many have you done? Um, my podcasts, I um, almost at one year with my podcast. There's about a hundred and thirty of them. Plus, I've done probably oh ten or fifteen just uh, articles that I wrote and then read them. They're like uh, fifteen hundred, two thousand words, so it's like ten minutes, you know. Uh, and that's really what I cut my teeth on is doing those first. And some of those were very awkward. Uh, even the, the recordings that are still out there, some of the recordings are very choppy and awkward. Um, but I came into it slowly like that. As far as the liberty movement itself goes, you know, I was very on and off. I was very enthusiastic in the late 70s. 
and uh, life and the state and everybody just kind of kicked me in the teeth, and so I quieted down and hid, you know, hid among the statists and got a job and just earn a living and raise a family. And then each time, like in the mid '80s or in the late '80s. The, I would feel literally feel guilty about what was floating around in my mind that I that I couldn't really do anything about. Uh, in the '80s, I had a little bit of a of a, uh, the ability to express it in '88 when Ron Paul ran as the Libertarian candidate. But even then, the vast majority of people had no idea there was a Libertarian Party, much less who this weird doctor was. You know. So again, I would just pound that all back down, keep it quiet, go back to work in the in the aerospace and defense industry, you don't do a lot of talking about uh, that kind of liberty. <laughs> the word liberty in that industry means we're blowing up people in faraway countries, and therefore we have liberty. But uh, it really, once I, once I got out of there and I was able to speak my voice freely, then I, I you know, first, first writing on the Internet under... A dozen different fake names, you know, uh, hoping nobody would connect them back to me. And then eventually, one of the people on the internet that I have a lot of respect for, a, a fellow podcaster in the survival end of the of the spectrum, a guy named Jack Spearco, he said, "If you're not able, if you're not willing to to be honest about who you are, and come out front and say this is me, I'm a real person. I'm not hiding behind a you know a fake name. This is me." If you're not really willing to do that, then immediately there's a question as to how honest you are. And I couldn't stay hidden any longer. I had to come out. That was about a year. Well, actually, I started being uh, using my real name about two years ago. But uh, it took me then about a year to get the website all together and get financial backing and that whole thing. But that's my story. <laughs> well, that's, that's, a great, that's a great story. And, you know, it is sad. Even when I was a, a blooming anarchist, I was kind of... You know, I would try to avoid the word, you know what I'm saying? Now I have no problem saying it, and I, I can defend, you know, my argument pretty well, um, and at least show people the, the, the gun in the room, as they like to call it. But it is sad that we, we've had so many anarchists, it's like you're in the closet, you know? Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. Like you're, you're watching the gay community come out, and you're, you're, you're thinking to yourself, the next step for humanity is for the anarchists <laughs> to come out of the closet, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's what it feels like to me. And uh -huh. so we're, we're stuck in this world where so many people are on the either on the, 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 the border of the fence, they don't know whether to jump over, uh, or they've already jumped, and they're kind of like hiding behind a rock. And, <laughs> you know, they don't want their friends to know how... how, how you know, their, their mind works, even if there's nothing to hide. You have facts, you have reason. So if there's one thing I can tell people out there is do not be afraid to make the message of anarchy mainstream. That's our next goal. That's how you create real change. That's how you spread it to more individuals. Like I've said before, you know, I, I'm not here to change the world. I'm just I would like to change the world. But what, what, what I say this rest of the show, I'm sure what I'm going towards. It's not that I'm here to change the world. Um, per se, is I'm trying to change a few people who I believe will help me change a lot more people who will go out there and make it mainstream, and that's how you change the world. So, you know, it takes uh, little chunks here. It's, it, it's not like, you know, you can just tap a whole oil field in, in one night. It takes years and years and years of solid pumping. It, it's a long, thought-out process. I personally never think, I, I don't think I'll ever see true voluntarism in my life where it stretches the globe. We have no more Koreas. We have no more Chinas. We have no more Americas. Um, we have no more, no world, one world government either. None of that stuff. But we just have truly, you know, like peaceful interactions for the most part. Um, maybe you could, you could look for some type of private protection services, which would fight for efficiency and have many competitors uh, trying to, to bring the best protection and try to, to catch the most criminals without, you know, while infringing on the least amount of peaceful people. That right there in itself, I think, is the, you know, um, the future that we need to show people more often, help them understand it. It is uh, the next step. Um, and the first step of that is to get more people active, like I was saying earlier, buy webcams, get a headset, uh, get on that on the internet like I'm doing, and uh, you can get your millions of hits too. It's 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 really just uh, about consistency and keeping to the message. That that's what I think we need to focus on, and it starts by 
taken the first action of just signing on to YouTube or on Facebook and getting an account mm -hmm. and connecting with other people who are in a similar mindset and, you know, helping their friends and family members see the, 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 the reality of the situation, which is that the state, even if you want to build up a state, you can have people build up a state all they want, but that state will never have the, the, the legal right or, or the ethical right to aggress and infringe or, or impose taxation or mandates or drafts or, or war on drugs on peaceful people. There is no such thing as, as violence, uh, good violence on peaceful people. There's no such thing as that. Um, that's all we have to, to help people understand while helping them see you know, a future uh, without the state, to help them not fear uh, not having this violent monopoly, you know, basically dictating down to us, helping them understand, you know, see through all the propaganda where the state basically comes to us, and especially our children, and says, we're the protector, when well, they're really the infringer. You know, this, this extortion-based proprietary and security state is an oxymoron in itself. It, it is so hypocritical, I, can't, I don't even know where to start. You cannot protect property by first stealing it. That will never be a true axiom. You can never hold that as a virtual fact uh, or an ethical fact. Uh, it's, it's, it's contradictory. And that's one, you know, another point we need to continue to handle. I, know I have lots of, of points here. Um, but really, I, I think I've, I've summed up quite a few of them in, in that speech. Um, but Ben, you know, when you had that video the other day that you made, um, you, you hammered away on so many points. I'm trying to think of a few right now. One of them was basically that people are government. Uh, when people say, well, the government builds the roads, the government builds the schools, or the government builds hospitals or something like that, to that effect. Well, technically, the people that are a part of government are doing it. It's just regular people. Yeah. You know, people have this, like, film that's like there's this this uh, anti-kryptonite, uh, you know, suit that's built onto government. The rest of us are, are weakly affected with kryptonite. And uh, with only the state can push away this kryptonite and make all of us stronger and push us forward. That's just, that's the opposite of it. It's, it's nothing but uh, aggressive coercion. It's, it's, it's intervention into efficiency. It's, it stops efficiency in most cases rather than helping. And I'm sure there's some safety regulations that are good, but you, that doesn't mean you need the state to do it. You're going to have to have a couple firms really have some bad things happen, and then the rest of the population catches on. And uh, you, you don't need somebody telling you, uh, you know, don't drive off the road, right? You don't need a sign that says that. Mm -hmm. um, but for some reason, we, we, we think that we have to have the state telling us what to do in our lives every day in every single realm, telling us what to eat, telling us how to raise our kids, you know, telling us what we should be doing more of in our lives. And, you know, if they have these suggestions, uh, they can pass them on, but they do not have this ethical right to steal from us. And that's another thing. I do want to stress the fact that people do have a right to form, uh, you know, some type of a collective. I am. Ne I will never say that anarchy is 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 no collective. You can have a voluntary collective. What I'm trying to say here is that it will lead to aggressive coercion in the end. It will have power mongering, um, and that it will not end in the best interests of of, of the average individual. Mm -hmm. And that every single form of collectivism takes away a choice from an individual, uh, a choice of freedom from an individual. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we need to to think of and understand every government that's ever been out there has been basically let off the chains even five seconds after the constitution was signed the state started just swallowing up you know what, what, what little bit of freedom they tried to actually protect in the first place in the republic it's it's all a farce so when anybody tries to tell you hey we can fight for this minimal state all i have seen is federal income and revenue increasing it from a tax perspective perspective sixfold since 1901 since 1901, the government takes in six times more re tax revenue uh, and has a lot more of gross GDP than it did, you know, just 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's completely out of whack. But it's, it's for anybody to honestly believe that you can even cut that in a third, let alone a half or, or even into 10% or 5% of what it is today, to me is, is just, uh, you know, they're fooling themselves. We have to be rational. When, when the state does come to this point where we have to, first we have to educate enough people to, to what the state is and have enough of them not support the state, once it starts to, you know, the, the dead start to crumble and they don't have, you know, the, the Ponte scheme is running out, um, that's the best chance for us to truly push it away forever. And um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with a lot of other voluntary staff there who believe in the, the single-time eradication principle, which means basically once you get rid of, of statism, 
in humanity, just like, you know, uh, in America, how we got rid of chain slavery. I don't think I'll ever see chain slavery come back again. But it's so funny. She would have said 300, 400 years ago to, to a slave, oh, you know, in 500 years, slavery will never be again in, in America. People would be like, are you freaking kidding me? They'd be laughing. It's going to go on forever, they'd say, you know? Yeah. The same thing is with status today. They're basically defending an unethical position that they have little knowledge about, and they try to pass it off as, as the ethical argument because it's for the many uh, versus the, the few who control. But the opposite's true. The politicians are the few controlling the many, uh, and, and not virtuously. They do have special interests. They do use aggressive coercion on peaceful people, and they always will. And this is what the system produces, and it can't produce anything else. It's inherently built that way. Yeah, it's it's as simple as that old state as that old statement: uh, two rights can't make a wrong. I mean, if you really think about that, you, uh, oops, I said that backwards. Two wrongs can't make a right. And the same thing is true with government on any level. It doesn't matter. You know, some people say, well, if we just shrink it down to where it's like this or like that. Well, go get involved in your city council, and you'll see corruption that you never imagined existed. It's 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 any time that aggression is used, and and this belief that it's legitimate. Once you accept that belief, then it's like the genie's out of the bottle. There's no possible way that you can reel the thing back in and say, well, you know, thirty percent aggression's okay, but not thirty-two percent. This is where we have to draw this line. Well, that doesn't make any sense at all. You know, you, you either accept that aggression upon peaceful people is immoral, or you have to accept that aggression on peaceful people is justifiable. And, and when you really come to that point, then the only thing I think left is the practical outworking. Okay, well then how can we make it work? Well, well if you really believe that it's unethical to aggress upon peaceful people, you don't have to know every aspect of how it'll work. You, you've already guaranteed that it will work. And, and, you know, it, that's, a, that's a great point. I really do agree with that. Uh, and along, along this topic here, it's important for people to realize that, you know, that this aggression, this taxation, um, it's, it's not just theft, okay? It's a lot worse than just, a, you know, I'm going to threat to steal from you and then I steal from you. you know, I, I like to actually step people through the whole process to help them really see the reality of the world that they live in mm -hmm. and see if this is actually civilized behavior. And what I mean by this is, I'll, I'll ask somebody, what happens if you don't pay your taxes? What happens if your grandma doesn't pay her taxes? She just doesn't want this. She's tired of funding the war. She has a moral obligation not to fund it. She wants to give to charities that are actually going to do something. So your grandma just says, as an adult, to see the world, I freely, you know, as a person who should be free, decide not to just give my money to this inefficient system. What if they believe in this other thing? What happens if your grandma doesn't pay their taxes? And, and I don't just first answer, you know, after they give me whatever response they give me. I don't just jump into the fact of, oh, they're going to arrest her, you know. I first, I, I walk them through the process. I say, listen, they're going to actually send her a letter, mm -hmm. okay? And it's going to say, hey, you forgot to send us your check. You forgot to file your taxes. Um, uh, you know, please fill this form out and send it. Mm -hmm. And then, and then later on, a couple of weeks down the road, they they won't get their money, and so they'll they'll write another nice letter, and uh, it'll be a little bit more firmer this time, of course. And it'll basically say, now come on, give us the money. We don't want any trouble. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And. Uh, once again, she's like, well, you know what, I still peacefully just disagree with this. Um, uh, no thanks. You know, I, I feel like I could protect myself better with this other protection agency and protect more of my neighbors than having this, you know, Monopoly police station that, does, that would rather write tickets for seatbelts than, uh, you know, catching uh, theft and rape and murders, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just don't want to do that. So the third letter comes in. It's basically like, this is your last warning. This is it. If you do not pay us this money, you we will be coming to your house. You no. know, and, and, uh, it, you will not have a choice as to whether to answer the door this time. You know, and um, once again, she continues to say, "I should have the right to not pay into this Ponzi scheme to what I believe is unethical. I'm an adult. This is what I earned. I labored for this. This is my life, my labor." Uh, my property, I should have the right to do what I want with it, and I choose to not support your unethical ways. They will come to her house with guns drawn. They will point them at, at your grandma. They will point guns at your grandma, at her at whatever uh, the family member she has in the house, her, her pets, her cat, her dog. Yep. Um, they will arrest her. They will kidnap her and throw her in a cage, and then they will steal her money on top of it. So this is the reality of what people somehow have come to know as civilized behavior 
to me is the, the least civilized thing I have ever heard of and how so many individuals in my life allow me to be raised around this not knowing it is, is, is very upsetting. Still to this day, I, I have issue uh, with you know many people in my life that possibly knew about this or could have known about it, took in the time to simply tap into their ethical side and never did so. Yeah. And so it, it's forked my environment growing up as a child and my raising. Um, so I, I am a little <laughs> uh, bitter still to this day, and I'm trying to, <laughs> to, to let some of that go. And it's been a very hard path. But there's something I've realized, you know, forgiveness, it's, it's, it's not always for the person who needs to be forgiven. It, it's for the first for the person who's forgiving. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's a win-win situation. It's actually not parasitical, but it's symbiotic. Um, and that's, that's something I've had to come to. Another harsh reality, uh, another lesson of life that uh, volunteerism has helped bring to, to me and to my environment. Um, but yeah, everywhere you look, uh, we have to realize that taxation is just, uh, is much worse than just theft. It is threats of theft and kidnapping, uh, and, you know, basically assault. Yeah. kidnapping yeah. and this is just for some reason the way that people think it should be run and they don't see any problem with it they don't even question it they'd rather divert their time and waste it on things like the left right paradigm you know like i said in one video oh, oh if we had the glass eagle act out of this would have happened well the patriot act came too you know we should have had that back in 1990 and you get back in this left right argument and it's all over the place people just trying their best to ignore the ethical argument instead of focusing on political arguments. So that's why I try and steer people away from po uh, politics and towards ethics. Um, and I think that's the only way we're going to have, you know, children that are raised in a better world. Less war, less taxation, if we, if we can end the state at all, uh, let alone less statism. You know, on the, uh, on the grandmother argument, and that's an absolutely valid argument, are you familiar with the story, I think it's about six, eight months old, about the elderly lady whose husband used to work for NASA, and he died and left her a piece of a moon rock. Uh, no, I, I never heard of that. She uh, she had this you know this piece of a moon rock that her husband had been awarded by NASA. He had actually been given it, he had like signed papers the whole nine yards, and he had been given this uh, this reminder of the of the you know NASA trips to the moon, and then he died, and she thought, well, this thing's not doing me any good. Some collector would probably appreciate it, and any money I get from it, my grandkids, it would it would make their life better. So she tried to sell it, and one thing led to the other. And the way that they dealt with her, they baited her into meeting at a like a Denny's restaurant or something like this, and they did a hard takedown of her in public. This is seventy some year old woman. They did a hard takedown of her in public, in the Denny's. She literally wet herself as they manhandled her and hauled her out of the Denny's for attempting to sell her husband's moon rock because NASA claims permanent ownership on all things like that. And so when he died, technically, according to the paperwork, she was supposed to turn it all back into them. Interesting. No, I had not heard about that, but it does not surprise me. Unfortunately, we live in that kind of a world where... Um for some reason, the government owns the moon, too. Yeah. I mean, they, they think they own our property. They think they own the moon. They think they own us. You know what I'm saying? This is, <laughs> this is the world we live in. They, they think they own us. And uh, they, nobody, nobody owns you. If there's one thing I could stress to everybody out there, you own yourself. Mm -hmm. This is about self-ownership. Never bow down to another master. Never do anybody else wrong, either. I mean, I mean I'm, that's not a command. That's just a, a respectful gesture. That's, mm -hmm. that's something that's uh, what I would consider sound advice. Um, but you, you don't need to bow down to anybody else. These people do not own you. You own yourself. You have the right to do whatever you want as long as you don't infringe on others. Uh, I will repeat this point until the day I die because it is the best antidote there is to the state and to, uh, you know, this bully mentality. That's what statists really are. Mm -hmm. Like, they have any control. You know, I had this one person come in uh, uh, I was talking to, and uh they, they basically, I don't even think they knew who I was as far as, like, online. Just a regular person I was talking to about uh, politics. And they, they basically said something to the effect of, well, I, I want to take my children out of public school because they're going to teach them that, that gays are, are okay. And, and she's like, I, I don't give them my approval. And in my head, the only thing I could think of, the very first thing that stopped in my thoughts was, well, it's a good thing they don't need your approval. You know, who <laughs> in the hell are you, you know? <laughs> I mean, seriously, 
who are you? Uh-huh. To try and control their lives. I mean, it doesn't matter what they want to believe. They can be Buddhist, they can be Christian, they can be Muslims, they can be atheists. As long as they don't infringe on other people and don't harm other people and don't you know, infringe on uh, other people's freedom, there is nothing wrong. Yeah. So um, I, I, don't, I don't see why you even have a voice in their lives, in their, in their uh, relationship. You know, who are you? Yeah. Who are you? This is the bully mentality of, oh, oh, I have to have a word in everything. And this is another thing that's kind of hilarious to me when people are so gung-ho about democracy. Don't get me wrong. More people voting in the government uh, versus most monarchies, you know, throughout the world. They usually are a better standard of living. That doesn't mean that true individual freedom isn't the best. But, you know, this ideal that we have democracy already, true democracy, to all those who really believe in going out here voting and this is what's the best, true democracy would mean that you would vote on everything, mm-hmm. uh, on when your neighbor could, could eat, when I can literally go to the restroom, mm-hmm. you know, what kind of makeup my mom can buy, you know, on when I can breathe. You know, this is true democracy. Every second, you have to have a phone out there. And, and, my, and what I'm really trying to get out here is true democracy is impossible. Yeah. So, Really what people are praising is just this intangible, mythical uh, ideal of a state that somehow, you know, you can have enough people uh, controlling, uh, uh, you know, this other bad sector or bad ideal uh, to prosperity perfection. The, the, the truth of it is we need to have competing ideas, and that's what voluntarism allows. It allows for multiple peaceful people to go out there and express different ideals and ways of doing things um, outside of state intervention of efficiency because the state... I I don't think anybody truly believes the state is, is, is highly efficient. And I'm not saying that the businesses that are in the, the sector today, out in the world around us today, are, are efficient either. A lot of them come from government license and backed and protected mm-hmm. uh, and tax loopholes, subsidies, uh, you know, all forms of, of, of protectionism, whether they get uh, barriers you know, of, of entry tariffs on their competition, all sorts of things out here. Corporatism is running rampant. But corporatism is, is only possible with the state and its oligopolization slash monopolization powers. Anything outside of, of, of the, you know, government, you can't have corporatism. Right. So in a true free society, you can't even have corporatism. But it's, it's just so important for people to realize that the, this ideal of democracy that they've been raised into, it's really just a, a big facade. Uh, it, it has no validity as far as being ethical and right and just. It actually is unethical outright by infringing on, on peaceful people just because might said so, because might makes right. Uh, the, uh, that mentality is a bully mentality, not mm-hmm. an ethical mentality. So that's one thing we also have to uh, uh, help others come to the conclusion. Uh, uh, you know, Coming down the road here, it, it just seems to me that people need to understand that anarchy is not without government. Anarchy is choice. Anarchy is simply choice. Mm-hmm. So when people denounce anarchy because there's no government, they're not thinking about how it opens up freedom and choice for good people. Right. They're just thinking about how uh, their false idea of how the, the police will catch all the bad people is not going to be there anymore, even though it's failed flat, you know, it's landed straight on its nose, uh, face flat, tripped over, uh, you know, the roots of freedom sprouting up behind it, and, and, and now it's caught up to it, and it's in front of it, and it tripped and it fell, and it landed right on its face, right on its nose. And uh, the, the state is, is, is truly evil, but we really need to help people understand that anarchy is actually a good thing, it's a choice. So, you know, if we could shift that ideology from thinking of anarchy as no government, and instead, and keeping that as well, I mean, we want that characteristic, obviously, but to also shine the light that anarchy is choice, and uh, that's, that's really... Um, you know, the best way that we can approach any discussion or possible argument we might run into in the future with statists. One of the things that I like to throw out uh, in reference to anarchy is that uh, my family has family reunions. We've had, we're, uh, uh, we go in Appalachia, in eastern Kentucky, we go back all the way into the 1600s. So my family will get together back there in uh, eastern Kentucky and they have Oh, anywhere 50, 75 or more people will show up and we're miles away from the nearest real town. So there's no possible way police could get out there if there was ever any kind of a reason to call the police. And these people, a lot of them don't even like each other. And yet everybody shows up. Most of them bring food. There's always more food than we can eat. And many of them are armed, not always openly, but some of them openly. And there's generally drinking involved, although some of them are really strong religious people that don't believe in drinking. And yet, 
in all the years that we've had our family reunions, we've never had a single fight. We've never had a single incident that required any kind of outside authority because everybody understood if you're going to be here at this particular person's property and behave with the rest of us, then you're going to behave like this. Otherwise, we will self-police you and you won't be here. And, that, and it was just a silent understanding. And it's been anarchy year after year at my, at my family's family reunion going all the way back into like the 70s. And it's pure anarchy. And only four or five of them actually understand that. So we oh have anarchy. You're, you're scaring me here, Ben. Anarchy? How could you? <laughs> <laughs> but we have anarchy constantly. We just uh, we we just don't realize that's what we're looking at. Right, and you know this is this all goes back to I, I made a video called "Let Me Opt Out." Let me opt out, basically. I mean, <laughs> I guess the title kind of sums it up. Um, but I, I kind of went in depth about how um, you know I, I don't if I don't want to fund the opera, well, I don't want to fund this charity, and I'd rather give my money to a different charity or just keep it to myself and create another job by spending it inside the economy somewhere else. That's my choice. You know, I should have the right to opt out of whatever you're doing. Um, it's not, you don't automatically assume that the social contract that holds weight, that I'm automatically opt in to what you're doing. I, I have the right to opt out. Mm -hmm. And uh, along with that, another thing, and maybe in contrast to this, you know, help them understand, guys, you can't give away, you know, a right to somebody else that you guys don't even have yourselves. Right. Not only do I have the right to opt out of it, but you can't just say, oh, well, you know, I can't go uh, steal from somebody, and neither can Jane, but somehow me and Jane together can go steal from them. That's ethical all of a sudden. <laughs> no, that's not how it works, you know. Uh, it kind of goes back to the 1 versus 100 versus a 300 million argument I was talking about earlier. Point is, you have the right to opt out, at least in freedom. Satanism doesn't think you have the right to opt out, but you do. And look what happens when you do, you know, like what you were talking about with your family. It's not all chaos. It's not all bad. It's just people living and enjoying things without all this bureaucracy and red tape and, and uh, you know, people basically driving away uh, economies because that's what, you know, the, usually the stronger governments are, the less of a uh, productive sector you're going to have, especially as the government takes over production, that's an obvious. But, you know, going back to this argument, you have the right to opt out. Uh, well, just like you have the right to opt out of, you know, not funding opera mm -hmm. or not funding, you know, some certain charity, you have the right to opt out of government. And nobody has the right to force you into it just because a group of them come together and, and try to delegate this right to somebody else. We're about to run out of time. Uh, is there anything that you want to, uh, any links or any uh, uh, websites that you want to give a shout out to? Yeah, Ben, thanks for, first of all, for having me on the show. Um, hopefully I can come back real soon. Um, another thing, you know, I'm going to try and talk to Stefan Molyneux and see if you and I and James Cox and him, if all of us can get together on some type of a, a round table or, you know, some type of a discussion where the four of us are contributing and just go over things that we think are important. Um, maybe maybe we could just, you know, spend 30 minutes of his time. I know it's, he's a very busy guy. We were talking about this off air. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I look forward to doing more work with you. I thank you so much for your diligence in spreading the message of freedom and helping others understand uh, the non-aggression axiom, the non-aggression principle, and uh, true voluntarist principles. Anybody want to come check out my stuff? Hey, I, I appreciate your time. I'm always willing to talk to you. Remember, I'm a, I'm a busy guy. Um, I have, you know, I work 50 plus hours a week, and plus, because even when I'm at, at home, I have to run this this other institution, this other, you know, mm -hmm. this other private sector firm. But uh, I'm a busy guy. But if you want to come over and talk to me, talk anytime. I'm on Facebook. That's Facebook.com/slash Shanklin Mike. You can also just put in my name, Michael Shanklin, on Facebook. You, you shouldn't be too hard to find me. Um, I have my YouTube channel, like Ben Stone was talking about earlier. That's over at youtube.com slash Mike Shanklin. I also am a contributor at peacefreedomprosperity.com. Peacefreedomprosperity.com is a collaboration. It's a conglomerate of, of different voluntarists, and we post our favorite articles and, uh, and basically original new content on the site, uh, videos, articles, pictures. So come over there and check it out, peacefreedomprosperity.com. Also on voluntaryvirtues.com, that's my website, voluntaryvirtues.com. I, I think I'm about to hit 100. 150,000 hits on that website, which I really <laughs> haven't even marketed. So I'm, I'm pretty happy about that. You know, mm -hmm. until I start actually using the site more often, uh, we'll, we'll see what that goes. Uh, the YouTube channel actually is about to hit uh, uh, one million uh, video views, mm -hmm. and it's already hit over a quarter of a million channel views. So 
get involved. It's really fun. I, it's improved my life. I would encourage others to do it. Uh, come check out my, my videos. I, I think it'll at least create great discussion. It might give you ammo so you can spread it to your family and friends, uh, family members and friends who might be on the edge of uh, voluntarism. Those who are maybe open-minded or at least open enough to hear this type of an argument. Mm -hmm. um, I, I welcome you. And uh, once again, Ben, thanks for having me on the show. And I, work, I, I look forward to working with you more in the future. Thank you very much, Mike. And folks, for links to all those things Mike just said, and also for more on liberty, property rights, and the zero aggression principle, go to badquaker.com. Thank you very much for listening, folks. <laughs>